Okay, let's take a look at some examples of formative assessments and then just uh, you know quickly recap what it takes to build one of these things and then um, we'll also see what ISBE has some suggestions for formative assessments and we'll take a look at um, some sample assessments that have been built through some um, the ISBE math curriculum model project. So that's where we're headed right now. So formative assessments could include pretests and uh, just a quick note about pretests here is that pretests could come in two different categories. They could be an actual pretest where you've got a pretest versus a post-test and that's designed to show growth. The reason that you would give a pretest as far as a formative assessment is concerned is for differentiation purposes for enrichment. Um, and so you would you would say, okay, who already knows the content, then I need to go through some enrichment process for those students. A second type of pretest would be a prior knowledge pretest and a prior knowledge test is going to assess those skills that students need to already have firmly mastered before they move into the new content. So you would give a prior knowledge pretest in order to um, assess students to see who needs remediation. And while that remediation is going to come through grade level standards according to uh, the Common Core and what they would like us to do, this still is formative and it's going to in, inform our instruction process and how we need to remediate and who we need to remediate in which areas. So those are a couple of examples of pretest. I use these things called mastery tasks in my class and you could call them whatever you want. You could call them a warm-up or uh, you know bell work or something like that but just when my students come into class every day and they're, they're sitting down there's a few problems up on the board that are nearly identical to the homework that they've been doing and I want to see what can they do right now because oftentimes they'll come in with homework done. Uh, I have over you know 90 percent homework completion rates in my classes uh, but I want to know is, is it done right? Do you understand it? So not just did you copy it, did you walk through it, did you find the answers online and then you know get the homework complete but do you actually understand what you're doing? So that bell work at the beginning of class is really useful for me because then I can tell my parents to go in and take a look at those mastery task scores because I put them in my grade book as a zero percent category in my grade book but they're still there so the parents can go in and take a look oh the student on mastery task 7.1 um, you know chapter 7 section 1 did not do so well but on 7.2 and 7.3 they did great so before we hit this quiz that's going to cover all of 7.1 to 7.3 I probably need to go back and study 7.1 uh, more than the other two so it's a great way to communicate with parents and for students to know, hey, here's where I'm at in this particular section because um, our our textbook is uh, directly aligned to Common Core since we wrote our own textbook. And so the when we say 7.1, we know exactly what skills um, and understandings that section has to do with. Now, homework accuracy, uh, this is another one that, that uh, tends to be a, a touchy subject for people. Homework accuracy is a formative assessment be just because of all the things that we've already mentioned. Um, a homework can go out, we don't even know if the student's actually doing it and if, or if copying it or if their parents are doing it. Uh, for me, all my homework answers are online because I'm trying to teach my students a process of check, correct, and reflect on their homework so that they work through the homework. They check their answers online. Uh, if it's right, they put a star by it. If it's wrong, then they try and fix it. And if they can't figure out how to fix it, then they put a question mark by it and they know to ask me a question the next day. And then they're supposed to write a reflection statement on their homework that says, you know, one, one thing that they've done well, one thing that they need to improve on. Um, and, and so that check, correct, reflect process uh, as being a part of my homework means that the homework accuracy doesn't actually demonstrate mastery of content and nor does most homework accuracy. It doesn't actually reflect mastery of content and because of that I'm only using it as a formative assessment for um, you know our students actually using that check correct and reflect process. Same thing with homework completion. You know if a student completes homework they could uh, have every single one of them wrong and um, not understand anything about the mathematics that we've been trying to learn, but a student could not complete any homework at all and actually understand everything that we've been doing. And so completion is actually not a measure of content mastery, so it's, it's not a valid assessment. Homework completion is not a valid assessment. And uh, instead, it's what it does actually measure is effort. 
are the students putting forth the effort to begin with. So that's really what homework completion is all about. Where accuracy is about um, self-regulation strategies more than it is about mastery of content. Completion is more about effort than it is about mastery of content. So neither one of those things, nothing to do with homework, actually does demonstrate content mastery and therefore is not a summative assessment, not going to be included in a student's grade. I do keep track of both those categories in my classroom, but I keep them at zero percent. So homework accuracy is worth nothing in my class and homework completion is worth nothing in my class. And as I said, uh, over 90 percent of my students do their homework and um, I, we've been working pretty hard for the, the past quarter or so on the check, correct, and reflect strategy and I would say over half of my kids are really getting getting that down um, and, and benefiting from that and using homework as a learning tool um, rather than the dipstick that measures the summative in a, a summative way. Some other formative assessments that you might have used, participation in class, um, you know, exit slips as people go out, where are they at, so that you can kind of tweak instruction for the next day. That's a great one. Um, a weekly survey, just, you know, where students are at. I used to give a weekly survey on the check, correct, and reflect strategy. So, how, you know, how many homework assignments this week did you actually remember to check and correct? You know, how many of them did you write your reflections on, uh, just to keep students accountable to that. Um, whiteboard work is a great one in class we'll be working on something as a whole class and I'll give them a problem and they just hold up the whiteboard so I can see immediately what they were doing and I get a feel very quickly for how many students in the class are on track and how many of them um, need a little bit of extra help and then I can um, work with students on an individual basis from there other classroom activities are observational data I'm going to show you some ways that we can make this a little bit more formal and uh, practice quizzes are a great formative assessment. Not a pop quiz, but a practice quiz. If you can give students a practice quiz, then um, students actually perform better once they get to the quiz because they've, they've seen what it looks like, they've got an example of it now, um, and they're ready to go. Other projects and problem-based learning group work uh, would, would really be kind of formative. It's stuff that we're using to say, okay, where are you at, and where do you need to be, and how can I get you there? So those are some, just off the top of my head, some formative assessments. Now, when we do design these things, we we want them to tie directly to the standards, and I should put a caveat on that, when that's what we're actually measuring, okay? Because not all formative assessment data is actually measuring the standard because that's not the only thing that we care about. We also care about some of the, the soft skills, the work ethic skills in there. But if we want to use a formative assessment to see where they're at as far as the standard goes, then obviously it has to tie directly to the standard. Uh, the focus needs to be on the student's learning needs, okay? So what do they need? And then we're going to identify um, their current learning progress and we want results that we can act on. If we get results that we're just tracking for the sake of tracking, then we should stop. Okay, We don't need to track all those results if, if they're not actually useful. And formative assessment should be a regular enough part of instruction that it doesn't actually disrupt instruction, but it adds to instruction. And because of that, it's got to be quick and easy to give and to grade. So, you know, all that time that you've spent grading every single homework problem because we feel like students will only work for the grade, well, that's just not useful. That doesn't make it formative uh, assessment because you're not getting it back in a timely manner to those kids because we, they need it back quick so that they can make adjustments to it uh, and adjustments to their thinking process before they get to a summative assessment. Okay. Uh, by the way, while we're there, uh, it is really just a, a myth that, that students will only do homework if it's for a grade. Okay, We know that um, driving, having something be for a grade or a reward is not uh, something that increases student achievement. Uh, it may increase some of those students getting homework done but it's at a superficial level and it promotes more surface level learning than it does in depth learning. Uh, and you can you know, dig into that homework research yourself on that. I'm not saying get rid of homework, but I am saying it's definitely formative and we need to treat it as such. All right, so bottom line, if you don't use the data, stop gathering the data because we need to actually be able to, to use it. Otherwise, we're wasting our time. So let's look at a formative assessment here, another example. Here's an 8th grade standard, 8F4. Construct a function to model a linear relationship between two quantities. Determine the rate of change, initial value, uh, including reading these in different forms, and interpret those in terms of the situation. Okay, So how might we get, how, what would an example of a formative assessment look like in this case? Well, let's um, pull one up here. 
So here's a formative assessment that comes from the ISBE Math Curriculum Models Committee uh, that I'm a part of, and so this is function matching. And basically what we've done is we've taken uh, different modalities. So we've got uh, equations here, we've got graphs, and we've got tables. And so we're giving the students the functions in different ways. Each student gets their own little card, and then they have to match their card to uh, you know another student who has the same function. So what students have to do in this case is find the initial value and the rate of change to be able to decide who matches them. Okay, so to make this a little bit more formal, we used what's called an observational checklist. I'll be walking through this in a little bit more detail later as well. But I've got some ob objectives that I'm looking for. Can students determine, first of all, the rate of change of a function? And can students determine the initial value of a function? So those two things are something I'm looking for immediately. I can write a student's name down right here and just keep this on a clipboard with me and make any comments I need to for each student as I'm wandering around the room while they are also wandering around the room. So I'm watching as students are watching. We've got um, needs instruction level, so I can just put a check mark there or an X or whatever. Um, P would need to just practice on this, but beginning to understand it, and A, we're ready to apply this. So you can kind of think of that as this three levels. And I can check my each objective with that. So, and then my third one here, students can interpret the rate of change and in initial value in context. Oh, and I realize that's missing a value. Look at that. Initial value in context by creating a real life situation that makes sense for their given function. So there's the third objective. And then the fourth objective, which we put here in the teacher directions for you, is after students find all the other students with their function, they're, they're now a group of three, and they write a real life situation in which their function might be used. And so now we're getting at can they actually put this thing in, in context, um, you know, and, and make up a, a context that makes sense for that rate of change and in initial value. After they've done that, they share that with the whole class. So their group of three gets up in front and they share it with their whole class. And, and it's the challenge to the class to come up with an equation that matches that story because they're just going to share the story. This is a time where I would probably use whiteboards, and so as the group is presenting their story, everybody else has got a whiteboard, they've got their equation that they think it is, and they hold up their equation, and then once everybody's got kind of their thought, then you know we, we check what the equation actually was. The student reveals the, uh, the card with the equation on it, so one of these, you know, the cards with the equation on it here. So they reveal and, and see if they're right. Um, th what this is good for is uh, you, you've got all these objectives laid out and you can f formally see where students are at and you can gather all this data for them um, but it it's again it's in progress it's for learning it's not something where we're penalizing the students if they don't get it okay so this is um, some example or one example of a formative assessment and let me take you to one more example here or from ISBE up on their website. I just took this from their website and kind of cleaned up their table a little bit here. But these are some different types of formative assessments that you can use in your classroom. And uh, they've got some additional information on some of these, some examples and explanations. And there's about, uh, well, it looks like five pages of, of these different formative assessments that they provide for you. This is available on the ISPE website. You can search for it or it's also available on uh, my website as well in the resource section for, for these videos. Okay, so these are some quick examples that you can look over on your own. You can take some time to, to look at these uh, on your own and, and look through what could you possibly use. And our next video is going to be about um, actually creating something from the ground up, uh, a formative assessment from the ground up, and what sort of tools might we use, what other tools might we use to do that.